we continue to live in an unequal world. In spite of global recognition of the importance of equality, women are often made to feel less valued. Their self-esteem continues to fall below that of men, and perhaps counterintuitively, the gap is widest amongst younger people. This partially reflects a gender pay gap, which rather than narrowing, is actually widening. On average, women earn 89p for every pound a man earns. Just 19% of higher earners, that is those earning more than 150 grand, are women. Inequality has also been brought into sharp focus by the pandemic. Many women have sacrificed their jobs to look after their families and disproportionate numbers have been furloughed in the hardest hit sectors, such as beauty and hospitality. Apart from all this, some women have been able to save money during the pandemic. But those who have put money aside have, on average, saved only half the amount that men have saved. Our research shows that the pandemic has increased awareness of the needs to be financially independent, and financial independence is now the dominant contributor to our self-esteem. Most of us have felt trapped in some way during COVID, and this has brought home the importance of having personal and professional choices. When we asked the same question two years ago, body autonomy was the biggest contribution to women's self-esteem. The importance of financial independence has more than doubled since then, while the importance of body autonomy has fallen back to just over 20%, maybe not a surprise given our isolated state. Women's role as the manager of the family budget has long been noted and their responsibilities have only increased during the pandemic. With more of the family being at home and the need to provide for them on a 24-7 basis, women are trying to make the family budget go even further. Achieving financial independence means going beyond everyday family financial management. Long-term financial planning is a place where women feel much less confident. Almost half of millennial women, compared to less than a third of millennial men, say they don't know enough to think about investing and they are much less likely to have a personal financial plan. In spite of women's considerable, although quite subconscious, savings during the pandemic, our survey suggests that only 5% of women have talked to their bank or a financial advisor about managing their funds. Brand communications from financial services companies tend to perpetuate the status quo and typically depict women in their role as the manager of everyday family finances. They portray investing as either a man's world or the exclusive territory of high-flying women. These communications reinforce the idea that the investment industry is not only inhabited predominantly by men, but also lacks empathy and has a poor understanding of women. Indeed, both women and men believe that the industry has a better understanding of men, particularly on an individual level. Most worryingly, this gap in how well understood we are is greatest among millennials, and we know that it is around the age of 30 that most people start investing. The result is that wealth management is a distant concept for women. They feel at best disengaged and at worst excluded. This creates a lose-lose situation for women and for the industry. The situation may be, at least partially, a reflection of the 80-20 ratio of men to women in senior roles in the investment industry and the unconscious gender bias that this creates. It certainly creates a challenge. We believe, however, that there will never be a better opportunity for brands to rise to the challenge. The pandemic has changed the climate and the dial is moving from exclusive wealth to the creation and promotion of wider financial wellness. The award-winning This Girl Can campaign is an outstanding example of driving positive change, challenging preconceptions, boosting women's self-confidence and self-esteem and encouraging physical wellness. Through great insight, creativity and purpose, great brands have the power to make positive changes.
Okay, good afternoon everyone and thanks to Winnie for the introduction there. So this session will focus on providing inspiration and ideas for how we can tackle this challenge and drive positive change. To help with this, I'd like to welcome our fantastic panellists who all bring unique perspectives to this discussion. So firstly, Jo, she represents her readers in this discussion, uh, particularly relating to the Financially Fabulous initiative, which focuses on helping women to take control of their financial future. Uh, next, M Mitesh, he is passionate about creating an open, innovative and inclusive culture where, where diverse talent can thrive. And linked to the film a moment ago, we really feel like driving internal change is critical to this debate. And last but not least, uh, Tammy, she was awarded her MBE for services to gender equality in sport. And again, linking to the This Girl, Ca this Girl Can campaign uh, shared a moment ago, um, we feel like the parallels between finance and sport are really interesting related to this conversation. So uh, firstly, a massive thank you to each of you for, for joining us on the, on the panel today. Thank you. Um, Mitesh, I'd, I'd like to start with, um, with you. Um, when we spoke, you described this as not being a place for the tried and tested. I want to get your perspective on how you started to get the ball rolling and challenge the status quo in such a, a male-dominated sector. Sure. Um, I guess tried and tested doesn't work when we can all agree for the, for the whole of human history and certainly for our experience in it. We haven't created an equitable world, um, organisations, industries, companies and otherwise. Something, if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll get what we've always got. So something has to be done that's dramatically different. Um, how do we get the ball rolling? I think it's by really looking at ourselves and seeing we're part of the problem. Mm. And so what am I doing? What are we doing? What, are we, what do we need to do differently to be able to get different outcomes? Um, you know, I'm a strong believer that broken systems don't exist for any other reason other than they serve somebody's interests. So mm. understanding whose interests are being served and how we manage those losses in order to be able to create a different system requires a blank sheet of paper. So that's the way we've approached it. It's, it's really taking a blank sheet of paper to everything, really thinking about the entire host pipe and unkinking mm. all of the parts in it from attraction of talent to really understanding the, the selection process to the interviewing through to pay and promotions and culture and environment and so on, really looking through the entire piece to be able to see where are the problems and what needs to be done differently. And um, I, when we spoke, you mentioned when you kind of came into the industry, you felt like a, an, an outsider. How does that kind, of, um, that kind of experience affect the way, that you've, the way that you've thought about addressing the challenge within Reddington? Yes, <laughs> well, uh, I think coming in, um, I think somebody asked me recently, can you describe that experience when you felt like a fish out of water? And I said, I'm not sure when I, when I ever didn't feel like a fish out of water, so I can't predict a particular moment. Um, I have just felt like an outsider throughout my career, whether it's because of um, being an only child or the color of my skin or where I grew up, partly in India, partly here, um, mm -hmm. through to you know, being amongst actuaries, but being a slightly more creative social one amongst a group of introverts all the way through to kind of being a CEO in this role, but believing strongly that we need to create diverse and inclusive teams and that delivers commercial mm -hmm. performance. Um, so yeah, I have felt like an outsider and a champion of those um, on the fringe. Brilliant. And um, so Joe, just from your perspective and, and the perspective of your readers, what do you see as the kind of key things that need to, need to change yeah, well, I think we know that the confidence gap between men and women starts at a really young age. And I think that's to do with the messaging that girls get, you know, right from childhood um, around money. Um, within the family home, that might be who's the breadwinner, which is often dad, um, who manages family finances, who's making those like important financial decisions. And I think the experts now know that our financial blueprint is set you know, really young from like the age of seven. Mm. So that, so like good financial role modeling from your parents is so important. And I think for girls, especially seeing the female role models in their life, you know, being confident with money and making those decisions is really important. I think another thing um, we see is this sort of pervasive per perception of maths is for boys. Mm. And I think that still, you know, stands true now. So I think encouraging girls into STEM subjects is really important. I think at GCSE level, when it, maths 
is no longer compulsory. There's a real drop away of girls doing maths and economics. I think at um, A level, it's like 39% of, of the group is girls and it get, it's even lower at degree level. Mm. So that's, that's really important. And then a good financial education is good for everyone, you know, at school, if, you, if it sets you up with those life skills to help you manage your money later in life and gives you that confidence, that's great. Um, I mean, it is good that um, economic well-being and financial capability is now on the curriculum as part of um, PSHE, but I don't think it goes far enough. I mm. think it's such a small part of what they learn. And there, you know, there's a real focus still on less practical inf information, like you know, learning algebra. Personally, I think kind of learning about compound interest and taxes <laughs> would be much more useful for, for later life. And then, as Mitesh was saying, you know, women get into the workplace and I think their, their financial confidence is eroded even further by the gender pay gap because it sends this message to them they're not as valuable mm. as their male counterparts. And then lower salaries mean you've got less money to take risks with. So, you know, you can't invest what you can't afford to lose. So they're not investing as much. It translates into how much you can put into your pension. So, you know, the, the pension gender gap at the moment is 40 percent, which is just incredible. Um, and that translates at around, I think, seven, seven and a half thousand less a year for women, which is a huge amount. And then I think the other problem is the way that financial institutions speak to women. Um, it's something we hear again and again from financially fabulous readers, you know, that, that they find it intimidating. If we did a recent survey and something like 46 percent said that financial institutions were a necessary evil, which is just <laughs> not a good situation to be in. 32% said that they make things too complicated. And that's even true when it comes to investing. And there's still so many obstacles and barriers in the way for women, you know, that they find the jargon impenetrable. And they still think of it as something that men do. And yeah. I think that really needs to change. Yeah, when we're in, in our research, we've, we've definitely seen that, that linkage between risk and gambling and that mm. being a very much a male uh, aspect of interest. So it sounds like that's very much. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think women are very focused on sort of, you know, the protecting the family money and, you know, the short term, you know, day to day, mm. looking at paying the bills, you know, making sure there's food on the table, that side of things. And um, they're not encouraged into the risk taking. Mm. Investing doesn't speak to them, I don't think at all. No, no. And then, um, Tammy, mm. what kind of uh, parallels do you see with, with what you've heard so far? Oh, in the I'm, world I'm of... blown away because the parallels, it, 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 it feel, we're in totally different industries, but it feels like we're doing the same thing. We've got the same opportunities and barriers. We're just playing with different toys, for want of a better <laughs> word. Yeah. Um, I mean, women's sport has been under-resourced for decades. Um, but I think there's a, there's a massive understanding that it is the biggest potential area of growth for the sports industry. And we did some research at the beginning of the year and cited that um, we, there's the potential for the women's sport industry to treble its value mm. within a decade, which is massive. Mm. But in order to do that, we need to change internally. We need to, things need to be valued internally before we can um, before we can get the value externally. And we um, did some research again towards the, the end of last year during the pandemic where we pulled together leaders from across the sports industry, from all the different sectors. That was rights holders and digital platforms and broadcasters and funders, all those sorts of leaders together to identify what their ambition was for the industry mm. and also what they saw were the opportunities and the barriers towards that growth. And, um, uh, you know, they were absolutely fascinating from uh, developing the commercial case to data to professionalizing all those sorts of things. But the, the strongest thing that was, was coming out to me, the strongest theme was the need for more diversification across the industry. Mm. We need to be, to, to, to be more diverse Historically, the sports industry has been too white and too male. Um, and until this change, it's, if you've got the same people there, the same outcome, similar mm -hmm. to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. So we need to change everything up if, in, if we're going to actually get the full potential, the full value that's, that, that's possible. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and just linking to mm -hmm. the point that Jo made a moment ago, she talked about the, uh, you know, the sense in school that, that mm -hmm. uh, boys gravitate to maths and science and so on mm. earlier on. When we talked before, you, you talked mm. about the early gendering of, uh, of sport in schools, for example, as a... Absolutely. As there's still there's a, um, a perception in, 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 in many areas, not, not all of them, I think things are changing, but that um, boys do particular sports, women do other sports, and actually um, we've got to break those um, mm. stereotypes down. Um, 
<laughs> and one other thing that I was really interested in when we when we spoke early was around how the how the pandemic has has acted as a catalyst in your world for change. And we mentioned that on the on the film a moment ago. I, I just want to get your get your take on that. I think I think you've got some really interesting things to say there. Oh gosh. Um, well, I think the, the pandemic was was um, has been really interesting because I, I think what it what it did was highlight the inequalities that existed. I think that the start of change is to develop an awareness that mm. there's of, of what's going on. If you can't see it, you, you don't even know that you need to change. You don't, you know. So you, firstly, developing an awareness. And then there's some sort of um, discomfort that needs to happen in order to change. Mm. Um, so the... the you know, the, the, we, it also, the pandemic was, threw us into a different environment. An environment is incredibly powerful. It forced, it forced us to become more creative. It's forced us to look at things differently because there's no other way of doing it. Mm. Um, and I look at, um, for instance, uh, the absence of spectators within stadiums. So for, for a long time, the, I mean, there are many arguments against um, broadcasting women's sport, but one of them that you heard time and time again was we can't broadcast it because there's not enough people in the stands. Um, which you couldn't really argue against. And then suddenly, actually, we've got nobody in the stands. Suddenly we have to think creatively about how we tackle that problem because mm. it suddenly becomes relevant. So it's awareness, a discomfort, a relevance to my, to my own sort of, um, my own lived experience. I'm, I'm sort of forced into making change. And I think the pandemic has made the inequalities incredibly um, obvious and it's forcing us to think creatively. Mm. Um, so in that way, it's a, a, you know, there's some positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and Joe, just thinking about your your world, um, do you feel like the pandemic has opened up any opportunities to change from the perspective of your of your readers? Absolutely. I mean, we know, you know, we know that the pandemic has, has hit lots of us hard financially, but I think it's hit women especially hard financially. We mm. know they're more likely to have lost their jobs or been furloughed. You know, I think three in 10 have lost, had had drop in income. A third have been able to put less into their savings than usual, a fifth less into their pension. So it really has impacted mm -hmm. them. And I think for our readers, it's been a real wake up call because, you know, they've realised how quickly things can change and mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether that's a loss of income or your health, you know, deteriorating. Yeah. And so that's, that's really brought home to them the importance of having that long term financial stability, mm -hmm. which I think is really important. There's also been a big divide between those who struggle financially and actually those who were able to save. And I think for them, they've really realised, you know, how much they were spending day to day mm. on all those kind of temptations <laughs> that we, we all know about. Mm. And, and how easy it is actually to save if you don't, you know, those temptations aren't in your past. So I think that's interesting. And there's a lot of potential there because from what we're hearing, they're keeping that those savings in cash. Mm. They're not investing them, so which obviously is, you know, something that, that needs to happen probably. Um, also, we've seen a big shift towards financial wellness. We did a mm. survey recently, and I think a massive 98% said that financial wellness was more important to them now, and more than half said it, it become more important in the last 18 months. And I think there's a growing awareness that that's not just about how much money you've got in the bank, but also looking at your beliefs around money and mm. you know feeling empowered and, and in control of it. So I think that's really important as well. Um, and I think some of our sort of best received initiatives that we've we've done during the pandemic we did a series called your money in tough times um on the good housekeeping website which is all about you know kind of content that was around like the pros and cons of mortgage holidays you know getting support for small businesses and that was really successful we had i think in the first three months of the pandemic we had like a 48 percent growth in traffic to the to the money mm. Um, channel on the website which is great and we've also had a lot of interest in our financially fabulous newsletter which goes out every every couple of um weeks and then another initiative we did which was within hers not particularly financially fabulous was cosmos um homemade house which was in partnership with nat west and they supported five young women from diverse backgrounds to live rent free in a house in manchester for a year and they gave them financial education along the way and that has done uh, that's been a phen phenomenal mm. success and um, i think the, the metrics are amazing like they reach one in three women aged 18 to 34 and i think that was so successful because they spoke to women in, in a context that they understand they came to them rather mm. than expecting those women to, you know, to go to that West and get that information, which is not going to happen. So I think that's why, you know, that, that's the, that, there's so much power in going to where women are and where they feel comfortable. 
Yeah, I think that was one of the things that I was really interested in when, when we spoke about how, you know, banks and financial services institutions need to go to where where women are rather than expecting them to come to, to, to where they are. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do, you, do you have any other sort of thoughts in terms of what, where you think um, banks and financial institutions should be with women? Yeah, to I mean, this? you know, we, <clears throat> we spend so much of our time online now. I think, you know, in places like Instagram, TV, you know, YouTube, Net, TikTok, that kind of thing. I think those are, you know, especially younger women. I think that is, is you know, such a right place for there to be financial education. Um, something we did pre-pandemic, which was really successful, we, we did sort of finance and fizz evenings, which we brought together a panel of experts and women turned up with their friends, you know, always their moms, their sisters, etc. It was a social event, you know, they learned something, but it was in a relaxed setting. And mm. I think that really works, you know, it's, and it's storytelling. It's, you know, it's not just like these are the hot, cold hard facts. I think that, that really appeals to women. Yeah. Thank you. And um, uh, Mitesh, I'm, when we spoke, we talked. Uh, you talked about um, some of the interventions you've made to address um, to address this challenge internally, specifically in relation to, you know, recruitment, as you mentioned earlier. Can you can you sort of talk a bit about how you the types of interventions you've made to yeah. to really sort of move the dial? Yeah, I'm really happy to. And, and I think it's so important that we're sharing. Kind of what we're doing, what we're learning, what's working, what's not working, because it's kind of in that how, in the day to day, that we've got to figure our way through this. Um, a big part for me is actually listening to women um, and getting their feedback, uh, getting out of our echo chamber and believing we know, you know, what 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 to do. So, for the first example is five years ago, soon after I became CEO, um, a senior woman in the organisation said, "I'm not sure I can ever make a managing director." in this organization and um, I was a bit perplexed and she said, well, the criteria requires, it's very clear in here that you've got to be someone who pushes yourself forward and puts your hands up, hand up for stuff. And that's just not who I am. It's not, and, and probably true for many other of the, the women in the firm. And just hadn't, it wasn't conscious, it wasn't deliberate, mm. but once we knew we changed it immediately. Um, and, you know, had a real kind of transformation in, in women being able to get through and, and be managing directors in the firm. I think moving through that, the other specific things have been recognizing that when it comes to pay and promotion, on average, men will shout more, mm. even if they don't have all the competencies for that next role or for, for money. And when you recognize that, you say, OK, we need an off. We need something to counter that. So you've got to empower your remuneration committees mm. and your people teams to be able to challenge that, to say, OK, there's a man and a woman who are eligible for this promotion. You're recommending the man because he's shouted for it and he might resign if he doesn't get it. Um, let's look at the competencies and see who ticks the boxes. And time and time again, it's the woman that's ticked more boxes, and yet it's the man that's being put forward. So re understanding that and setting your system to be able to tilt that, not necessarily through quotas. Um, again, talking to the women in our firm, they said, we don't want quotas in the organisation, mm. but there are systematic things that we could do, do better. Um, I think one of, the, one of the big things that we've been working on this year has been recognizing that as, as, as investment advisors to kind of the asset owners, the pension funds, the insurance mm -hmm. companies, et cetera, uh, we advise on half a trillion pounds of assets across all of our peers, the multi-trillion pounds of assets that we're advising on that are invested through thousands of funds into, you know, the kind of thousands of individual companies. We have a real influence we can play here, but we were all asking different questions and almost competing on DNI. Mm. And what we said was, why don't we get, this isn't an area we need to compete in. This is actually mm -hmm. where we should collaborate. So challenging the status quo was getting reaching out to all my peers and saying, how about we work together and get a common set understanding of how are we going to measure the inputs? Mm. Because the outputs may take time to change, to actually see progress that's being made. Um, so we're still iterating, making lots of mistakes and learning. Um, but I'm really encouraged by that that kind of progress and the specific interventions that are having an effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that point around iteration and willing to, willingness to take risks and think differently, that sounds like it's been really sort of fundamental to how you've gone about this. Yeah. Um, I, I, moving on from, um, from that, you, you mentioned the point about competition. I think when we spoke, uh, mm. Tammy, that's, uh, that's also something that people see in the world of sport, the competition mm -hmm. between male sport and, and female sport, for example. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like from your perspective, well, I'm interested to get your take on, on how that, on, how, on, on a different view on that maybe. Um, yes, we tend not to, to use those co comparisons as an organization. I don't always think they're 
um, they're helpful given how um, far behind women's sport has been in the um, uh, in, uh, compared to, to men's sport. I think when we came on board, our, our goal was to, I think we had the strap line changing women's sport from worthy to irresistible. We wanted to <laughs> stop it from being the nice thing that we all should be doing, for, for pe rec getting people to recognise how incredible it was and the potential and the opportunity um, for uh, commercially as well. Um, and again, I, I, so I, a lot of echoes with, with what you're saying, Mitesh. I think our approach has been, been, we've got, I suppose, these three sort of work streams. And one is that influence and, 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 and gain uh, awareness. And we're doing a lot of stuff around um, data. We're tracking visibility data, playing that back to broadcasters and so forth to make them more aware of the opportunities that are being missed and the opportunities that could be taken and, and to have those um, d debates behind closed doors. Then secondly, we're, we're working on educating. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many people who are sold on the idea. They see the opportunity, but they don't know how to go about doing it. So actually giving them practical guidance of this is how you um, can make change within your organization. So all our research is, um, is very actionable. So much time we spend talking about issue and not, not actually understanding how to make those changes. So we, we um, try to make sure all our research is, is, is actionable. And then thirdly, there's this, I suppose, this, this support stream, and we work with elite athletes to help them to, um, uh, to speak up more, to, to understand what they care about, to understand how to influence. And in many ways, that's kind of like talent pathway as yes. well. Um, so understanding that the athletes are incredible talent pool, but giving them the support, getting them, opening our black books up so they, they understand how to work the system, et cetera. Um, so again, I'm, I see so many parallels with, with, with what you're uh, describing. I, lo I love um, your example of worthy to irresistible. <laughs> um, so I mean, I'm, I'm gonna reference what we talked a bit about in the Brand Z session earlier mm. today, which was around the really critical importance of creativity and innovation. Mm. And I, I don't know whether you've got any recommendations for, the, for how brands should be thinking about this in terms of uh, engaging with female sport because uh, mm -hmm. it, it, that seems like a real opportunity. Um, yes, I think the um, and again, it's not comparing to um, uh, to men's sport all the time. You know, women's women's sport. The research done um, recently um, by. Um, Oh, no, I'm not going. I can't remember the organization now, the space, space and beyond, I believe, um, about I'm um, looking at the, the sports fans, women's sports fans. And actually, women's sport fans have, tend to be much more interested in um, uh, purposeful, they're purpose, purpose driven. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity for brands to, while working with women's sport, to really. Um, that's whole social impact. What do they care about? How do they want to, to prove to their audiences that they actually believe in the environment or believe in um, gender inclusion or whatever it is? Women's sport is a, is a massive opportunity for brands to tell their story in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yeah. sessions today about yeah. brand purpose and I didn't yeah. brief you on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and, and Joe, uh, what do you see are the kind of opportunities for more fundamental change in relation to your, your, your readers? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, some of the things we've touched on already about there really need to be some sort of, you know, some deep seismic changes, I think, about the way women are seen and treated in society in general, but also, you know, within the workplace, especially, and, you know, genuine equality, you know, not just the, the gender pay gap, but also, you know, equal caring responsibilities, whether that's mm. childcare or, you know, elderly care, I think that would make a massive difference. And that would just naturally lead women to feel more confident about managing their money because they're on an equal level, aren't they? And then that, you know, attitude passes on to the next generation and it's mm. like a virtuous circle going round and round, which mm. is great. I think there's still, you know, massive taboos around talking about money, I think is, you know, and that really holds women back. And mm. um, we, when we asked our readers about this, we asked them, I think it was about uh, 1,500 good housekeeping readers, what they find hardest to talk about. And 30% of them said money. And that's above, you know, sex, death, mm. <laughs> which is amazing, really. Mm. And, you know, 32% of them wouldn't talk to a friend if they had money worries. Even more worryingly, only, th I think, 36% said they found it easy to talk to their children about money, mm. you know, and that's really going to hold you back. And talking about money and being open not, doesn't just help your confidence and your well-being, but it also, you know, is really important when you're asking for a pay rise, when you're negotiating a better deal, you know, those, it's really crucial. 
Um, and then something else we've talked about a little bit is the way financial institutions talk to women. I think that's something that really needs to change. They need to think about the language they're using, but also the places they're speaking to women. Um, I think one of the reasons Financially Fabulous has done so well is because, you know, it's embedded that content in brands that women already trust, like Cosmo and Good Housekeeping Red. And so they're much more open to listening to what we have to say. I mean, when, you know, whether it's about investing or insurance or softer subjects like financial well-being, they will take that on because it's mm. coming from us. It's not coming from, you know, something that they don't know anything about and don't, don't trust in. Yeah, and, it, and clearly kind of um, addressing that through the generations is important. And I, I, when we spoke, we, well, and in the, in the video, we mm. talked about how there's a specific issue for young women. Um, and you talked about how we're generally a culture of spenders rather yeah, than savers. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, you know, I think young women, the way they're spoken to about financial from buying financial institutions tend to be all around spending rather than saving, which is just such a problem. And you just have to look about around the, you know, the messaging around buy now, pay later. It is so targeted at that sort of 18 to 25 age group. Mm. And, you know, you don't see anything about investing at all aimed at them. So I think, you know, that, that really needs to change. And I think that would have a massive impact. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and Mitesh, um, you know, you've obviously driven a lot of change within your organisation. What do you see as the kind of key outcomes of that? And, and where do you think you can go next with, with, the, with the change that you've driven? Uh, the, I guess at the heart of it is um, kind of five, five and a half years into this, we are, you know, we, we remain and continue to be one of the fastest growing companies in our, in our sector. Um, but beyond that, our client satisfaction, our, our net promoter scores are, are kind of off the charts and continuing to improve through the pandemic and through this period. Um, what's really important and interesting is that what we're also seeing is a company recognising, to your point mm -hmm. earlier, our social responsibilities. So we've embedded as you know, net zero, transition to net zero mm -hmm. as our default strategy to all of our clients which again has been a benefit of this diversity of thought around the table. Mm. So I think actually just diversity in and of itself doesn't necessarily lead to better decisions because you can actually mean you argue more mm. with a lot more perspectives. <laughs> it's the inclusion bit that means you figure out how to have the conversations that bring those different perspectives together mm. to be able to, to, to make better decisions. Mm. But I feel those are tangible benefits we are experiencing and we are kind of building on. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like coming, coming back to the point that we talked about, that driving uh, the business with a purpose is, yeah. is really fundamental. Mm -hmm. But I'm going um, to I'm gonna, uh, uh, just bring Winnie in here. I, I think... I like some knock-ins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got some Q&As from the audience, so I wonder whether I'll just like, throw it to the floor and see who wants to pick it up. So, uh, first of all, lots of comments about you know, how great the panel has been, so thank you. Um, <laughs> First question is um, from someone who is anonymous. So recent data that shows that men are reluctant to take full paternity leave. How can they be encouraged to genuinely take the share of the load? Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to start. One of the, one of the again, by listening to our employees, um, one of the things that one of the, the, the male leaders within the organization had said is we need to improve our paternity benefits and our shared kind of shared parental mm -hmm. benefits. If we're really systematically, mm -hmm. yes, we've closed our gender pay gap, we've brought it down significantly, but fundamentally we need exactly this, men to share more of this responsibility mm -hmm. if we're actually gonna change this in the long term. So it does start with the benefits, but it also so that the companies are providing. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's the role modeling of it. It's actually making it norm, the norm for this to be used and celebrating those who are using it and balancing that with their success in their career and within the business. That's really interesting. Um, Alex, did you have any personal experience to share? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just shared paternity leave when, uh, when my daughter was born. And it was such a, yeah, it was, a, I mean, personally, it was a great experience, but I think, uh, you know, sharing the load uh, from, from very early on in a very equal way in our relationship made a big difference yeah. to how we brought up our daughter. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot around, you know, more role model than itself. Um, we've got another question around how do you identify systematic biases within an organisation? I think, Mitesh, earlier on, you talked about, you know, looking at job specs, people actually reading it and found, uh, actually, there might be some hidden biases. So 
where do you begin and look and you know how do you identify it it could be Mitesh you want to pick it up first and then maybe like pick up by Tammy and um, Joe as well yeah I'll start very briefly just that actually I found just asking asking women <laughs> <laughs> it seems pretty you know it's not rocket science uh, speaking yeah you know, we've, we've got a very engaged women's network within our organization and a lot of companies put in place these employee networks, but they don't listen to them. And it's actually going there as leadership to say, well, what are the barriers? And what is getting in the way of you thriving and succeeding? What is, what is holding you back? Mm. Um, and, and they know, and, and they're able mm. to talk to you about it. It's, it's making sure you're actually listening rather than assuming you know, um, for me, is the, the biggest way of identifying it. I don't think I could re read those things or look at those and come up with any different conclusion than I would have done otherwise. I need someone to point it out to me mm. that's affected by it. Mm. I suppose yeah. for us, it's been, we've been um, using data. So our mm. visibility research that we did at the start of this year, um, part of that was looking at um, many of the big sporting bodies and looking at how many uh, images there were of uh, female athletes versus male athletes on their websites. <coughs> Um, you know, those, those sort of looking at the social media, all those sorts of things and having the clear data that shows the inequality. Um, because again, I, th I think, um, I don't think of, often people don't want to be doing things equally, but sometimes they don't realize that they're not. Um, so when you, you've got clear data on something like numbers of images, I think that makes it uh, more obvious. I think one thing that struck, struck me from some of our conversations, by the way, is being open minded about what data you're looking at as well mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thinking differently about the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the data that you are assessing, uh, thinking differently about that. Yeah, um, we've got more questions. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there, probably your point around, you know, talking about that particular case study really struck a chord because we've got more questions <laughs> about, you know, how can we help women to rise up organizations and actually like tackle a better percentages of women in senior levels? Um, sponsorship um, is really, really important. And, and sponsorship is different to, to allies. I know there's a lot of jargon here. It's somebody actually, you know, taking, looking, uh, you know, working with you and speaking for you when you're not mm. in the room. So if we say the room is largely occupied by men, mm. by white men, white men from privileged backgrounds, mm. you don't shift diversity without one, somebody at that mm. table speaking for somebody that's not in the room mm. in those important discussions when those opportunities are coming by. And I think that that is absolutely critical in shifting that. I think also being open about bringing talent in. I think when often when, when I see organizations trying to address the, the gender mix in their organizations, they'll start at the graduate level, um, which is good, <laughs> but that's not necessarily where to go. You, what, and what we did was we ran, you know, returnships. We said, well, there's, a, there's clearly a huge population of people who are taking breaks in their careers to raise families or for other responsibilities mm. who aren't coming back into the, into the organization. What's getting in the way? Mm. And actually it was that a lot of recruiters don't even consider you if you've got, got a gap in your CV. You get through to that and you get to the interview and the interviewers don't know how to talk to you about the time you've had mm. out. And so there's a, mm. the interview doesn't go as well. And then mm. you're thrown into a role and it's like, well, do you have current experience and relevant experience? Because the world's changed so much since you, there are so many barriers when you start to unpack it. But you know, we hired senior female talent into our organization through programs like that. And, and, and the other thing I learned was actually on balance, hiring a senior female executive took me four times longer than hiring senior male executives. So it required me to plan a lot more in mm. advance to knowing um, because there were, more, there were more ties to the organization. There was more loyalty and actually responsibility for other female networks mm. that they found much harder to walk away from. Um, so it can be done. It just requires you to do it. So it comes back to my point, be systematic about it. Mm. Leave no really stone unturned. I, mm. I like the way that you talked about that in winning in the war for talent as well. Yeah. You know, it's not a, you know, you're not doing this for the sake of doing no. good and so on. A commercial advantage. Yeah, totally. We're, but we've got better talent and mix of talent in the organisation as a result. I think there's also a need to be flexible all about what those senior jobs look like as well, because, mm. you know, I do a job share, for example, and that's something that some, mm. for some roles that wouldn't be considered. And I think that's a shame because I think you do lose female talent, you know, by not making roles part time or not yeah. making them job shares. Yeah, it really, really resonated with what we were talking about this morning about you know, inclusion and diversity. And I think last question to throw in before we end this particular session, I think we can talk 
for quite a long time about <laughs> this particular topic is maybe Tammy, I'm, I'm curious to think about, you know, because, you know, we brought you in because from it's a completely different angle. Where do you think is the next frontier? You know, financial services is one of them. What, what do you think? Oh, women's support. <laughs> 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 I mean, it really, I mean, get in there. And uh, for all the, the audience who's, uh, you know, it's, it's a brilliant opportunity to, uh, to sponsor and uh, to get involved, definitely. Maybe next year we'll do a study around women's sports. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Mm. Um, thank you, Tammy, Mitesh, Joe, and Alex for this wonderful conversation. Mm.